Hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us, whether it's uh, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. We are very excited about this webinar and we cannot wait to get started. So let's do just that. Um, as you all know, this is our introduction to IT networking. We have our amazing experts, Robert Lassinger, who's got a bit of a haircut since that photo was taken, and Dave Cousins here. Uh, they are going to be walking us through everything and doing all kinds of things online today. Um, we also have quite a few people standing by in the background. So Sabatino, uh, you can see, is online. We have Sam also from Distech. We have Corey and Jan from Optigo. So we have lots of people in the background that are making this work today. And we'll be there to answer your questions. So if you do have questions, we will be getting back to them throughout the webinar, even if we may not be verbally answering them on the webinar. So please, please, please use that question box. And that's it for me. It's time for me to turn it over to the experts. So Robert and Dave, I will let you take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, just want to uh, talk about the agenda really quickly. Um, we have a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, we have all the previous webinars with us, uh, material that we want to cram into a single uh, webinar and do it live. So uh, a lot of moving parts here. Um, what we want to talk about today uh, is designing the network. So um, let's start with uh, what, are, what building are we doing? Um, what does the network look like? What are the pieces of it? Um, We'll do a bit of that on, uh, in the slides and we'll do a bit of that in, um, in a spreadsheet. Um, and, uh, and then we'll jump right into the, uh, uh, the live devices uh, and, and you can watch us set that up on Robert's uh, switch rack. Um, and you can follow along as, as uh, uh, Monica said with the, uh, uh, with the, the picture that we've uh, provided uh, for you to download. Um, we're going to talk about internet connectivity, we're going to physically set up the network, we're going to do a whole bunch of refinements to uh, make that network work really well, uh, and we're going to talk a bit, a bit about troubleshooting as well. All right, so let's get into network design uh, to start out with. Um, we're actually going to do a case study with a small building, um, and in this, in this particular case, um, as you can see by the, uh, the, the masterwork picture there. Uh, we have a two-story building. Um, and basically what we're going to do is um, on the first floor, we're going to have the main floor office, and that's where our server room is going to be. Uh, and we're going to have a warehouse, which is uh, in the picture. You can see that on the, on the right. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have offices, uh, offices on the second floor. And we need to connect everything up. Um, and we need to uh, connect the building controls cameras, and all, all of that sort of stuff using IT. Um, <clears throat> so let's get started on that. Um, first of all, we've got to talk about prep. Um, this is a fairly small building, um, and, uh, and we don't have a lot of devices on our rack. Uh, you're, in real life, going to have quite a large number of, of switches and devices. Um, you're going to need to prepare and document that. Um, from a best practices perspective, um, there's a couple things that you really need, um, and then beyond that, um, you can build additional things on top of that uh, based on your process. Uh, but two things you really, really need are a, a network diagram. Um, now, most people will create a physical layout uh, of where wires are in, in respect to the floor plan. Um, that's great, uh, but what we're talking about here is how devices are connected to each other. Um, and so we, we've talked about uh, how fiber is connected between devices, which port they're on, or what the MAC addresses and the IP addresses of those devices are. So those are all things we've talked about in the previous um, uh, webinars. And we'll, we'll kind of refer back to that, and we're going to build a spreadsheet and a diagram um, as we go as well, uh, which we alluded to earlier. Um, <clears throat> one of the keys to this is when you hand over that building to the maintenance people, um, they need something to reference. Uh, obviously, anything that you've done to build this system and to, uh, we talked about segregation and security and all these important things, um, you want to be able to describe that so that they can then troubleshoot it later if there are ever any problems or if they want to build on top of that. 
what what I'll do, um, actually we'll come back to that after this slide, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna start with the planning the IP connectivity. Um, so this building uh, in particular it has one IP address uh, out to the internet. Um, it's basically uh, it's connected to an ISP. In this case, uh, for the live example, we're going to be using Robert's ISP, um, and uh, and what you need for that is a router to, to talk out to the um, uh, out to the internet through the default gateway. Um, so we're going to use a multi-purpose router in this case. Uh, we want that router to be able to do um, all of the uh, normal routing uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll show you some examples of that um, within the existing router. You can see a picture of it here in this slide. Uh, and we'll show you where that is in the rack uh, for those of you that are watching or with the PDF uh, document. You can, uh, you can spot that right away. Um, so th this is basically a device that will allow us to VPN in. Um, so we talked about that earlier. VPN is the, the secure way to allow remote access into your system. Um, and so this will take care of being the endpoint where the VPN connects to. Um, it'll do our, our, uh, all of our routing <coughs> um, and it'll send packets within the network and also outside the network. Um, it'll do all of our IP address management. Um, so we're going to use private IP addresses on our, on our network. Um, if you remember, I think it was in the third webinar, uh, we talked about NAT and how to um, do port mapping to an internet IP address so that we can get multiple devices being able to talk out to the internet through one IP address. Um, and then, of course, the firewall. So we're going to, we've set it up to block um, uh, traffic that, uh, that we don't want coming into our network. Um, so uh, here's where we're going to pause uh, and we're going to jump into the actual. Um, the actual live demo portion. So, um, if you look over at Robert's switch rack there, um, he can probably show you where that was. Right here. Yeah. So we've got the we've got our um, uh, router, and uh, the second thing we're going to do here is I've got I've got a connection here. Now I I'm showing you Robert's screen here. Uh, let me refresh it. Yeah, there we go. All right. So um, this is the interface to manage the um, to manage the router, and I'll I'll, I'll pass this over to uh, Robert to talk about that. Thanks, Dave. So we're using we're using a, a firewall here that's going to serve multiple functions. But before we get too far into that, we want to stress that you're not this what you see here is not going to be specific to any job you might use this is just one we decided to use because it serves multiple functions but you might run into cisco or juniper or palo alto or and your customer will likely have something they're setting up and in our case this one's serving multiple functions it's doing uh it's a firewall it's the gateway it's providing dhcp addresses we're doing vlan to this but on a customer site especially a big site they may have separate people doing all these functions and certainly separate devices. So uh, here we just want to cover what, what we're doing to kind of get us how we're going to get Dave into this network so he can set everything up for us. And he's going to do that remotely. So the first thing to notice is we're just using, uh, we're just setting up some basic functions here as a host name, domain name. These are generic. They're not specific to anything we're doing. Uh, DNS servers, these are just so they can go out to the internet and resolve domain names. We've talked about these before in previous webinars. Um, and then for the interfaces, we'll start with the WAN interface. So we're just getting an address, a single address from the internet, from our ISP via DHCP. So that when we bring up the firewall, it'll ask for an address. The ISP will provide us one, and then we can get to the internet that way. So, and that's all we have. So to get everybody in here, we need to use a single address and we need to get Dave access to the entire network. We're going to set up all the VLANs and all the devices. So we're going to we're going to start by talking about. Well, we can go back. We'll start by talking about the VLANs themselves. So ahead of time, using using the Excel sheet that Dave's going to cover here in a few minutes, we need to create the VLANs we want. Now it's not important initially to know what devices you might want on them or necessarily how you want them address, but you need to start assigning some VLANs so that when we get into 
setting up the switches and the edge switches that we've already decided what's going to happen up here. So you see here, I've named uh, VLAN 102 for display. I've named 103 for AHU. I've named 104 for VAD. On a site, you may decide that you have a different way to organize. You may A customer may actually provide these to you and not just tell you, hey, you have 200 through 210. They may not tell you why they gave you that. They, have, they already have other things assigned. But uh, we've chosen these here because they match the third octet for the IP addresses we're going to use. And I'll show you that next. So if we look over at the DHCP server, when we set up each of these VLANs, we're going to give it an IP range. And in that IP range, we're going to run a DHCP server to hand out IPs. Now, this isn't required, but it is very, very typical of most networks that you'll have a DHCP server running when you're on each VLAN to hand out addresses so that when somebody plugs in a device, it receives an address in the appropriate range. So for instance, here, here's the supervisory network. And you can see here that we've assigned the subnet 10.222.101. And if you notice the third octet here, it will match the VLAN number. There's no requirement to do this, but it's a common practice to make it easy when you're starting to troubleshoot and you have a big network and you know the, if I know the IP of, of IP address of a device, just by looking at that IP address, I now know which VLAN it's on without having to do any additional testing or looking around. So it's, when you're setting these up, if you have a choice, try to find a, a logical means by which to organize them. Otherwise, if it's a big network, you're gonna have to be referring to a, a cheat sheet or an Excel sheet quite a lot. So you'll see here, we have all the VLANs we created and we've given them all a subnet and we're assigning IP addresses here. Now also what we, typically what you'll want to do before you start hooking up devices, if you have the MAC addresses for your devices, which ideally you should, if, if at all possible, you're gonna wanna use the MAC address and in that VLAN, you can associate an IP with it ahead of time, long before the device ever gets on site. So, for instance, this tech products, on the side of the box, we have the MAC address. And the same holds true for Optigo's product. You can look on the side of the device in the box and you'll see the MAC address. So you don't have to, you don't have to wait till it's powered up to do this. You can provide this, you, if you're doing this, you can do this ahead of time, or you can even provide it to the customer or the customer's IT department and ask them to do this part for you. And it's better if, they, if you do this ahead of time so that when the device comes online, you immediately know what IP address it's gonna have and so you can access it immediately. Let's move over. So on to routes. So when I create those VLANs and I assign them addresses, the way traffic gets between them is with routes. And you'll see here, and the reason we're bringing this up is we're gonna show on Dave's computer before he VPNs into the network, he's not gonna have any of these routes. And when he successfully authenticates and logs into our network, all of these routes are gonna show up on his computer. And once he has them, he'll be able to ping and open web interfaces or get to any protocols he needs on these devices. So, and you're moving over here. We'll go over to, uh, let's show OpenVPN real quick. So here's the OpenVPN server. And I just wanna bring this up real quick. These are basic settings and depending on your site, you might not be using OpenVPN. You'll likely be using IPsec or Cisco or some other client, but all of this part will hold true for whatever VPN client a customer provides to you. You're going, you're going to have to choose which routes are available to the customer. And that is, I can find it here. I guess that was over there on the routes. Yeah, there they are. So back to GIST. So when I, when I set up the VPN server, I had to enter all of these routes so that when Dave logs in, all of them will be passed to Dave so he can get to all these devices. For security reasons, I don't have to provide all these routes to Dave. If I only, if Dave only needs to see, Dave works for Optigo, he maybe only needs to see the management interface for the Optigo switch, I'll only give Dave a route to VLAN 100 because that's where his stuff is. So if he's helping me or doing technical support, maybe that's all he needs. So I can set that up or request from the customer to give me that to that route. But it's important that when you're talking with a customer or you're setting these things up that you understand with the VLANs, you need to provide some more information to the customer for what you need. And routes is part of that. The IP addresses you want, they'll typically set up the routing for you, but you might want to define what you want for IP ranges. 
And then, so from there, whoops, we'll go over and we will watch. I've created a, an account for Dave here, and we're going to watch Dave authenticate via OpenVPN right now. Great. All right, so uh, Robert was showing you how to set up the server side uh, of that VPN. Um, I'll quickly show you the uh, client side. So I've actually already installed a, um, uh, a VPN client, and there's, there's lots of them out there. Um, you can pick any one in particular. Um, the one I've picked uh, here is called Velocity, but that's not really important. Um, so we have uh, the, the, you saw there was a TLS certificate. Um, there is uh, the VLANs uh, routes that uh, Robert was talking about. Those are prepared for me. And now I can log in to the, um, to the system uh, using this VPN client. And it will create a, a secure tunnel across the internet. Uh, and it will give me an IP address on uh, Robert's network. Um, so before we start doing that, um, I want to show you a couple of things. So, um, on this screen here, this IP address um, 10.222.100.30, um, if, if you were following along earlier and noticed the IP address ranges, that's actually in Robert's network. Um, that's actually the network controller uh, .30. Um, I, I know that ahead of schedule, but uh, if, if I try to um, if I try to hit that, it it, it, it can't route me to it. Um, so I have no access. Uh, you know, in, in, in addition, um, one second, I will get the terminal window up, and I will show you a couple things there as well. Um, let me just clear that real quick. So um, if I try to ping that same server, it's unreachable. Um, also, um, let me show you. So on my laptop, I have some um, some routes that are set up. Uh, every router, uh, sorry, every laptop, every computer um, has some level of routing associated with it. Um, I, if you do a net stat, um, second, if you do a net stat uh, command, and then this is on Linux, um, so it's di there's different commands for different. Um, uh, different operating systems, but this will give you a list of all my routes. And if you look at all these ones here that are 10.12, so that those are all the routes to stuck within the Octagon uh, uh, network. Um, so, so those are all set up for me locally here. Um, and then things like um, uh, you know you've got your local host and so forth. So the, none of Roberts are in here because that would be 10.222.x.y. Um, so uh, as you can see, they're not uh, set up at all. So uh, what I'll do is I will now connect to Robert's network. And of course, this is e uh, setting up a TLS-based uh, tunnel in the background, using the um, uh, the certificate to uh, secure that, and of course my password uh, to prove who I am. Um, so what you'll see is this thing is connecting to so little dot, dot, dot. And now we're connected. All right, and if you look right here, I have an IP address of 10.222.1.3. Um, so you can recognize that as being on uh, Robert's network. So now we, we have a secure tunnel co connected. Um, so and I appear on, uh, I'm on. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, that's on my screen. If you want to show, that's already, you logged in. Yeah. All right, and if I come back to Robert's screen, um, we've got a session set up, and there's the same IP address. Um, so we're connected. And we can prove that a couple ways. Um, let, me, uh, let me grab my terminal again. So we could run that ping command. And uh, we're going to time out on that one. That should be out now. Let's, let's look at my uh, routes really quickly. So you can see, first of all, my routing table is quite a bit larger. Um, but I've got all of these 10.222.x.y. 
Um, so they're using a, uh, this is the interface right here, it's, it's the, the tunnel. Uh, so that's a secure tunnel. And I have access to VLAN 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, and 105. Um, we can refer back to that later, but we actually have set up a, a, a 106 as well, uh, which is our security camera. So I wouldn't have access to any of the traffic coming from the security cameras. So um, if this was Robert's building and I was a contractor, um, he'd basically lock me out from access to that. So I can go in and maybe do some troubleshooting on the switches, but I can't see the security cameras, which gives you an added level of security for your VPN. Okay, um, let me put that away. And I'll come back here. And yeah, now Dave, Dave, when we when we were setting up, we just connected the management port between the ONS 600 and the SA. So you'll be seeing that right now. Because we had, we had okay. disconnected in preparation for this, all the ports from all the devices. So I just connected yeah. the management port from the, ON, the 600 to the ONS SA right here, yeah. so that now those two devices are on. So they'll be coming online shortly. Okay, so it's gonna boot up. All right, so I, I'm connected and, and I'll continue to have a connection to that network and that'll allow me to do some management uh, um, as well. Um, let's go back. Actually, before we go back, uh, we did mention a, uh, a spreadsheet. Um, we've got a format that we use and we'll share that with you guys if you want. Um, and in this case, uh, I have, here's the four switches that we'll be dealing with and, and you can see the ports and what's connected to them, which VLAN they're on, uh, what the MAC address and IP address are. And if we keep this information um, and pass it on to anybody that needs to maintain the building, that'll be very helpful for them. But it'll also be very helpful for us to set up. So I'll show you how fast um, I can actually manage um, setting up the network, uh, setting up all the VLAN basically from this. All right, let me go back to the slides real quick. <clears throat> so we're going to be jumping back and forth, so you have to bear with us on the uh, transitions here. All right, so this is uh, this is what we've just taken care of. So um, I'm out here on the internet in the bottom left corner here, um, and. Right, well, in the bottom left corner of that computer, I'm connected to the internet, um, and then the, the router, which is on the upper uh, left side, uh, is connected to the internet, and, I, and we've got a tunnel that's going through between those two devices. Um, what Robert alluded to as well is um, we have our network controller, which um, has a green faceplate in the, in the middle top of the screen, um, and we've connected that to the router as well. Um, so, so basically that allows uh, internet access uh, to our aggregation switch, to our network controller, and we can build all the rest of the network out from there. Um, so we'll talk about doing that. So designing our physical network uh, layout uh, is going to be our next uh, uh, design concept. Um, now that we've got the IP, uh, uh, the internet connection all sorted out. Um, so switches, um, you saw the aggregation switch, um, that's going to be your head device that everything connects to, uh, to get out to the, uh, to the router. Um, so for, for the sake of doing as many different things as possible and the fact that Optical has um, pond based switches, uh, we've gone with fiber as our connection between the edge switches and, um, the, uh, and, and the aggregation switch. Um, and if you remember back, I, I think this might have been the first webinar that we did. Um, so for those of you that have been around for all of uh, all of them, well, thank you. But uh, uh, on top of that, hopefully you've learned that um, fiber is great for you know both long distance, but also fast and and and, uh, and high bandwidth connections. Um, so we're going to actually set up a fairly high capacity network on this small building. Um, and we're only adding a few devices, but we can imagine we would add a whole bunch to it. Um, the main floor is going to have two switches. Uh, so one's in the office section, uh, and the other one is in the warehouse section. 
Um, and we're going to connect those through a, uh, obviously we're going to have fiber, uh, but we're going to use a splitter. Uh, so it's going to be a fiber splitter uh, that will allow us to connect both of those devices to the same optical port on the uh, aggregation switch. Uh, in the upper floor, um, we're going to have a single router, uh, so, sorry, a single uh, switch. Um, and also to get as much as possible into here, we've, we've uh, included a power over Ethernet switch. And what that does is um, allows you to power the devices through their internet or inter uh, uh, the Ethernet uh, connection to the to the switch. Um, that gives us a couple of the interesting things. One, um, it allows us to remotely uh, turn the, the power on and off, and two, uh, we don't have to provide power out at the at the endpoint uh, where the devices are. Um, so we can we can basically control it all from the central. Whoever's whoever's managing this building won't have to go up to the second floor ever. Um, And then from a device's point of view, um, we're going to be connecting uh, devices to the switches via Ethernet. So we've got both types of connection. Um, and again, if you go back to the previous webinar, and you can see all the details, but uh, cheap, reliable, easy to set up. Um, you, you can run Cat5, Cat6 cabling uh, uh, all over the building uh, for a reasonably good price. Obviously not for long haul, um, like, like the fiber is, and generally less um, uh, bandwidth, but uh, still pretty reasonable. Um, so in terms of building controllers on each floor, um, again, from a topology point of view, we're going to have um, we're going to have a couple of different topology set up, um, and with a minimal number of devices. Uh, so what we'll do. On the first floor, um, we're going we're gonna to create a daisy chain um, between the uh, different devices in the first floor, um, specifically in the warehouse. And what that allows us to do, again, if you remember back to the previous webinar, um, we can reduce the cost of wiring by going from one device to the next device to the next device. Um, on the second floor, we're going to set up a home run type system where one port to one device. Um, and and that's uh, you know that that has other that has good security um, and and but it requires more cabling. Um, that that'll just be in the offices. So that's really probably not that much more cabling. Um, and then uh, we're going to set up cameras on each floor um, and basically for security purposes. All right, and I talked about the PoE stuff. So um, really quickly, we'll look at our network diagram. So I remember at the beginning we said build a network diagram so that we can see what's connected to what. Um, from the network controller and uh, aggregation switch and with the green face plates in the upper part of the screen here, uh, the yellow lines are going to be our fiber runs out to our switches. Um, on the top, you've got an ONS C810P, which is our uh, PoE switch with eight ports. That's our second floor. And then our first floor on the bottom, um, the ONS uh, YX uh, is our splitter. Uh, so that's splitting it to the two different switches. Um, so we've got, and so splitting adds some attenuation. I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, and uh, but you can see that there's uh, these things are connected very close to the aggregation switch. So we'll talk about it attenuating those uh, uh, those fiber lines. Um, so the uh, and and then the other thing to of note in this diagram is that we've divided things into uh, different VLANs here by the the colors. Uh, the management is VLAN 100, and I'll come back to the other VLANs. We'll go through it on the um, uh, the uh, what's it called uh, the spreadsheet. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So that's enough slide work. Uh, let's jump back into um, let's jump back into our physical setup. So here's here's our spreadsheet. Um, so we've got the ONS. Uh, Okay, we've got the ONS S8, which is our aggregation switch. 
Um, so our, our plan is that we're not going to use ports one through four. These these are the um, uh, these are actually Ethernet ports on the ONS S8. It has both optical uh, and Ethernet. Uh, but we we are we do have a uh, management uh, port, and that's that's actually already set up. Robert pre connected this device um, and set up the management port uh, on it and gave it an IP address because um, that's a very tedious process um, that takes a few minutes and uh, not enough stuff to talk about there. Um, second thing now, uh, we'll come back to tr how, we, how we're going to trunk this, but basically all of the VLANs are going to be trunked on this switch. Um, and if, if you remember back to um, our first, no, second uh, webinar, sorry, uh, we talked about VLANs and what they were, and uh, there's two types of VLANs. There's access, uh, two types of connections uh, for a, a VLAN. There's access to trunk. Access is from the edge switch out to the device, and trunk is where we have we could have multiple VLANs tagged over a, um, a backend connection. And in this case, um, from the aggregation switch out is going to be all on trunk. So all of our VLANs 100 through 106 are going to be trunked through that port. And, uh, um, and just to say, yeah, I was say it's, it's worth it's worth noting. Just remember, if you're using a trunk port, there's nothing there's nothing physically different about that port. It can be a standard Cat5, Cat6 cable, RJ45. It could be an SFP port. Really, the only thing that we're defining the reason it's a trunk port is because it's carrying all those tagged VLANs, and it's important that that if you have a trunk port, that both devices, the one on either side of that connection, have to understand that, right? So you can't you can't have a trunk port going directly to an ECY VAV or, a, or an ECY S1000 because they don't understand that. You have to have an access port because somebody has to, for those devices, somebody has to take care of assigning that tag for them. And that's what's happening on the access port. When one of our controllers gets plugged into that port, any traffic coming into that port, the switch will tag it for us. So that because the device itself doesn't really understand VLANs. So that's that's really the big difference from a controls from a controller standpoint, from a controls network standpoint. It can get more complicated, but that's for us, that's about what we need for what we do on a controls network. Yeah. All right. And uh, so and just briefly looking at the other um, tabs here. So we have a tab for the 810P. So if you remember, that's the PoE switch on the second floor. Um, and uh, that's got eight ports, uh, of which we're not going to use the first five. Uh, we have a camera and two ECY uh, VAVs. Uh, so those are controllers uh, for the uh, uh, variable belts. Uh, and so that will control the, uh, the air quality in the, uh, in the second floor. Uh, as, as well as the secure camera. And if you know, we've got the MAC address. You pulled those off the boxes. We've assigned them a specific IP address, so the DHCP server will know that. Uh, and we've given them specific VLANs. So VLAN 106, for example, is going to be our secure cameras. VLAN 105 is going to be our uh, uh, control zone for, for the second floor um, And then the two four, uh, 401Is, C401Is, uh, are going to be the two switches that are on the uh, first floor, one in the office, which is this one. Um, and I, I've put a note of that here. Uh, we, and we've also got, by the way, the uh, MAC address for the uh, switch itself. Uh, yeah, that's important to remember. Um, on the, in the office space, we have an ECY S1000 and ECY uh, 303. Robert can point all these out in the in the switch rack. If you're following along with the, um, uh, with the PDF document that we provided, you can you can probably see which ones they are. And we'll, um, we'll probably show point to them as well once we hook them up as well. So. Exactly. Uh, and then the warehouse, we're going to have a uh, the camera set up in there. Um, we're going to have a capture tool. Um, so what this will do is it will actually capture the uh, data uh, on the uh, sorry, the traffic on the network for uh, the purposes of troubleshooting, and we'll come back to that at the end of the um, at, at the end of the uh, presentation. So um, and then we have the we have a display which uh, Robert will show you where that is in, in the um, in the rack. Uh, 
right, right there, yeah. And then again, we have the uh, the VAVs for this uh, for the warehouse as well. And you can see they're both on the same port here. Uh, that just shows that these are going to be daisy chained on that port. And it, it, it's worth noting when you daisy chain devices, when you're playing at your network, you uh, daisy chained controllers, or at least for ECYs, they're going to all be on the same VLAN because they're getting that information from the port they're plugged into, since that's an access port. So if you put 25 VAV controllers on port four, they're all going to be on VLAN 104. So if you have a need to put controllers on different VLANs, it's the best policy is to give them their own port on that VLAN. So you can have, a, if you need a daisy chain of 15 on one VLAN, then separate it and pick up the other 10 if they need to be on a different VLAN, say for a, a TI build out or a different customer. So just remember when you're planning this, your daisy chains are, you're locked in with the VLAN. You know, you can't have two on one daisy chain, not with an access port anyway. Yeah. All right, and just to give you another view, so um, th this is our diagram, which kind of physically shows where everything is, uh, but this matches with our with our spreadsheet. Um, everything on the second floor is attached to this 810P, so camera, uh, two VAV controllers. On the first floor in the office, it's connected to this guy, uh, this, this C401 in, in the middle. We've got the S1000 and the ECY303. Uh, and that's on VLAN 103. Uh, in the in the warehouse, we have um, these other uh, VAV controllers, and that's on VLAN 104. And then VLAN 106 is across both floors, um, and that's the the security cameras. All right, um, and we're we're kind of zipping through this because we want to get to the uh, uh, doing this on the rack. Okay, so let's let's actually jump into the rack right now. Um, what we're going to do here uh, now that uh, this is connected, I'm going to connect into uh, the OptiGo One View. Um, so <clears throat> what what this is is uh, you also remember back from one of the previous um, uh, previous webinars we talked about uh, what's it called um, uh, managed switches. So all of these are managed switches. Oops, wrong password. Shouldn't talk and uh, type at the same time. Okay, there we go. Um, so what the uh, optical one view is just one example of a management interface for switches. It, it's ours, and so that's the one we're going to use. Um, and it, it will allow us to manage the various switches that we just talked about setting up. Um, what I'll, what I'll do is I'll start with uh, uh, just briefly showing you what we have here. Um, we're actually going to use the first two optical ports on that uh, switch. Um, and there we go. So Robert's showing them on the switch rack screen. And those, have, um, so those have their SFP ports already inserted. That's why you see them there. Yeah, that's why they're red here. So they, it shows the link down. We don't have anything connected to. The fiber is not connected in. Um, and we're going to do that shortly. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, this is basically showing us what is what is active, what's not active. Um, we also can see there's no edge switches connected to it at this point in time. Um, there's a ports panel, so these will be all the ports across the network. Right now, all you can see is the ones that are on the um, on the aggregation switch. And as I mentioned before, uh, we've got. Uh, basically, a management interface and a trunk and, uh, and a trunk set up here. So that D7 port, um, maybe Robert can point that one out. That one's connected yeah. to the uh, router right here. Mm -hmm. And this D6 port um, is basically one that we could plug right in a, uh, a we could plug a, a PC directly into it and manage it directly. Yeah, because remember, um, remember, we talked about that a little earlier, the trunk port and the access port. So if I, I if I were troubleshooting this, I couldn't just plug my laptop into D7 and, without some difficulty because that's not an access port. So it would only pass to me all the tagged VLANs. Well, so if I wanted to troubleshoot this, I would take my laptop and plug directly into D6 since it's an access port on the management VLAN, which is why we have it set up this way so that if we need to plug directly into the switch, we have a port with which to do it. Exactly. 
All right. So uh, without further ado, let's start plugging stuff in. Um, so we're gonna, yeah. There we go. So this is this is the fiber cleaner, and uh, we have to use this every single time we we try to reconnect the fiber connection to the switch. The even if you don't think it's dirty, it's too easy for you to pick up a little bit of dust and insert that in there and cause problems for the connection. So these, this is something, if you're doing this kind of work, you need to have this. They last a very long time. They're inexpensive and they're very simple to use, which you'll see me do now. And the first thing I'm gonna hook up is the attenuator. And it looks like this, it's small. It's very easy to lose if you set it to the side. So, but because these switches are very close to each other, we need to have an attenuator to connect them. Otherwise the laser is a little bit too powerful. So we're gonna clean this first, insert this, and then we'll insert the uh, fiber optic cable afterwards. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, you know, they, the, the switches are, are capable of working within a specific power range, minimum and maximum for uh, the laser. And so the, the laser itself is a little higher power than that. Um, and if you're too close, uh, it'll be too high power and the, and the switches won't be able to talk to each other. So he's, he's putting a 10 dB uh, attenuator in. You can see he's cleaning the ends of the, of the fiber. So the other thing to note there is that fiber, uh, any fiber connection comes with a cap. Anytime you do not have it connected, uh, you should have that cap, both ends. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what you can see on my screen uh, is that uh, we have a switch that is registering, and this process takes a few minutes. Um, and, uh, and there's a second one. Um, it's, it's automatically detected by the uh, network controller, um, and then that's why it's just showing up on my screen. Um, and you can see it's detected uh, one of the 401s. So that's the first floor. And some things of interest here are um, this, these are all on the OP1 port. So we talked about a splitter. Um, so there's a splitter coming out of that off one port that allows you to go to two different switches. Um, and it basically just takes the laser and uh, uh, refracts it or, and reflects it and sends it to two different locations. So part of the power goes to one place and part to the other. Um, I'm just going to refresh my screen really quickly. <clears throat> um, some of the other notes here are that um, we have the MAC address, so it's detected that. Um, and I can match that up with the MAC address um, on my spreadsheet just to make sure I have the right thing connected to the right place. Um, and I'll, I'll actually do that right now. So this, this is a MAC address that ends in 0456, and it's, uh, it's been designated as switch C2. Um, so if I go back here, um, actually the first one, so 0456. So this guy is actually C2. Uh, I'm going to actually Might even update that. it, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's also worth noting with these, if you have a large site and you have a bunch of DIN rail mounted switches, which would be common, um, yeah. they're all going to be the same model likely. And so if, if you power up and you have 13 of these things come online at once, you're not going to have any idea which one is which. There's not going to be any designator. So you're going to need to know the MAC address or you're gonna to have to walk around and collect those after the fact, which is not as much fun. So before you install these, or if you have an installer mounting them, it's good to take a note, take a picture or write down the MAC address so that you have it in your Excel later. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I, I designated the other ones uh, while I was here. So um, the one that ends in 1A60 is C1. And the other one was an A10P, and I only have one of those, um, and it was uh, C3. <clears throat> All right. And uh, as I was saying before, this process takes a few minutes, but it's, it's recognized them. Um, um, as, it's, as it's loading, it will, there we go, it'll switch here. So all this is being done behind the scene as there's uh, communication between the aggregation switch, the, um, uh, the never controller, uh, and the edge switches. So they're all registered now, and um, we've got the three, uh, the three switches connected. So first floor, office, first floor, um, and we, we, can, we can just put that in here. 
first floor office. Uh, first floor warehouse. Uh, and I, I apologize if my spelling is bad. It's generally atrocious. <laughs> uh, and I can make a note here also if this is a PoE switch, so that's of interest. So there you go. Um, so now, now we've got our edge switches connected. Um, we we can prove that we we've got connectivity here. Um, it's online. We have the information about the device. We can get more information about it if we want. So things like temperature, um, you know, TX power, RX power. So you can see. Um, after after being attenuated where that power level is at, um, that sort of thing. Um, you can see the ports. You know, these are four port switch, um, and there's nothing connected to it right now. Um, and right now it's set up as a default VLAN, so uh, we haven't actually assigned VLANs yet. And speaking of that, so, can I can we come over to the uh, firewall so I can yes. reference that real quick? Um, so you just you just saw that. Three, three of the edge switches, which are in and of themselves all managed switches, were automatically configured. Now, I, I had to set up this one for the demonstration, and I had to configure this switch to function, have all the VLANs we need um, so that Dave could come in remotely through the firewall. But it's worth noting, for me to configure the same VLANs here that we're going to configure shortly on the Optigo ones, not only do I have to completely configure this switch, I have to go through the items and it's a bit tedious to configure it in most other interfaces. So if I wanted to configure VLAN 103, I'd have to go into that and I have to identify every port that is going to be on VLAN 3. And on a large job, that can be a number of entries for each switch. And I would have to do this for each managed switch. Every switch I configured, I would have to manually go in there and tag every single port, which is a lot of entries. It's not terribly difficult, it's just very tedious, and there's a lot of room for errors. I made quite a few setting this up because, you know, if you look at this, it's not a very intuitive interface, and it's a bunch of numbers, and it's configured by VLAN instead of by port. So having to do this on a large job, especially if you need to make changes quickly, this could be very cumbersome. So it, you'll see now when we switch back to uh, Dave setting up the optical switches that the process to configure just three of these edge switches is very easy and it scales well. We could be doing 20 and it would take us very, the, the amount of time it would take us would just be slightly more to do this. If we were doing the type of switches that I've done in the past, it would be hours. And then there would probably be a few errors along the way, more than a few even, so. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's definitely one of the things you should expect from a management interface is that it removes the chance of error and reduces the time to do the tedious work. Um, okay, so one more thing I want to show you before we start connecting devices together. So uh, I'm back to the ports page here, um, and now you see there's a whole bunch of stuff on here. So this ports page shows all the ports from all of the different uh, edge switches as, as well as what we saw before, which was the, um, uh, the aggregation switch. So here, all of the stuff that we just added is all default um, so there, there's absolutely no, nothing configured in terms of VLANs. Uh, there's nothing connected to any of it, um, and uh, there's, I mean, there's really not much to say about it. It's just all default. Uh, one thing of note here is if we want to control the, the PoE, so the power over Ethernet, um, the two four-port switches don't have that capability, but the eight-port switch does. So I can turn power on and off. Uh, from this screen, uh, which will allow me maybe to reset a camera or uh, uh, turn off a device that we thought was uh, was uh, sending out a, a broadcast storm or something like that. Uh, so it gives you a little bit extra power um, in, in terms of controlling the network and maintaining it and troubleshooting it. All right, so now it's uh, it's time to start connecting up all the, the devices. And uh, before we do that, I just want to refer everybody back to the diagram real quick. <clears throat> so we've got all of these edge devices that we want to connect, um, the cameras, the VAVs, the controllers, um, and we have a picture of it so we understand what that looks like and what's, uh, what's connected to what. Um, we also have our spreadsheet that we talked about, uh, which is pre-built with VLANs, 
and the MAC addresses uh, and so forth. So um, we know exactly what we need to set up. Uh, it's just a matter of doing it. So what Robert and I will do is we'll go one by one through the devices and, uh, and make sure they, uh, they're actively connected to the network. Uh, so where did you want to start, uh, Robert? Uh, let's start with uh, either the first floor office or the first floor warehouse, your choice. Okay, uh, how about the office? Fair enough. Sounds good to me. So I'll, I'll zip over here and that's second floor office. Here's first floor office. So there's two devices to connect to it. There's an S1000 and a 303 and I don't know if you want to describe them as you connect them. Yeah, this is this is the S1000, and this is the 303. And the S1000 mm -hmm. is the the 303 is typically an air handler or an RTU controller, and the uh, S1000 is can be used as a plan controller or a supervisory controller. It's a pretty flexible controller. In this scenario, we're going to use it as a supervisory controller. It's going to serve up the graphics, it's going to have the trans, and it's going to have the user logins for the customer. So that's why those two are on this floor. We're gonna hook them up right now. And they're on our 401 down here. And I'm gonna tell me which port would you like to do first? Dave, did you wanna configure the VRM before we plugged it in? Yeah, let's put it on port one. Uh, so that is the office, so that's this guy here. So that's gonna be our AC, ACY 1000. And I forgot, so I'll have to go back here and check. That's gonna be on VLAN 103 as an access port. So I'm going to assign it to VLAN 103, this guy. Oops. Ah, I made a mistake and it corrected it for me. Uh, and that's the access uh, type. OK, okay. so that's I'll put uh, that in now. That's port one. Great. And you just saw the link change to uh, 100, so it's a 100 megabit uh, per second connection. Um, and it's up. So we now have uh, this device on. Uh, we can take a look at some details about it, um, its description, uh, it's enabled, and so forth. Uh, we'll come back to device security later, but, uh, but we're not connected. So we want to go to the second device on that. So this is the EC, uh, ECY 303. Okay. And we want to into port two um, on that same VLAN. All right. All right. So that showed up pretty quickly as well. So we got, we now have uh, port one and two uh, active on that switch. And that's all we had planned. Um, so now we'll go on to the warehouse. Uh, so in the warehouse, we've got quite a bit uh, set up. Um, do you want to start with the uh, with the camera? So we're sure going to put thing. that into port one on VLAN right. 106. And it's just one of these. And I, I will note before we plug this in, these are both PoE cameras. And on the A port, we can use the, we plug it in directly because the A, the A port switch can power it. But on the on this one, the 401, we're gonna use a uh, injector so that we can power the PoE device, but it'll still work just fine with the C401. So it's so worth noting, you can still use PoE devices in, in some instances, but you may have to use an injector to power them separately. All right, that's plugged in and it's online. All right, so let's just, let's keep going through that. So um, we want to put the capture. Well, we're not going to put this in yet, but we're gonna. We can plug. We can plug it in to get it ready. Right. Um, look. But there's it, we're we're going to use the capture tool later to demonstrate some functionality and yeah. some broadcast traffic. So it's but it's not live right now. Yeah. And then that display that Robert turned on uh, down the bottom, um, we're going to connect that. Uh, we're going to give it a VLAN 102. So it'll be separate from the other pieces. So that'll be on the third port. Two. OK. Um, and, uh, 
and now it comes to our daisy chain. Um, so we have two VAVs, and we're going to put that onto to one, uh, 104. So 104. And I'm just going to put a note, daisy chain. or just say one and two, how's that? But whatever description we want in there, but it's gotta be something useful. Okay, um, so what we'll, we'll see, this will be a little slower coming up because it's daisy chain, so it's got some, uh, it's got some work to do to connect to all the devices. Okay, and it's the last one. Ah, there it mm -hmm. is. Got it. That one was a little loose. It looked like it was in, but it wasn't quite there. All right. So we've got connectivity. Um, we can look at a little bit of detail. Um, see what devices are connected to it. So it's got one of them for sure. Second one will come online as we're talking. Um, so we're good on that one. Let's move to the second floor now. All right. Uh, go over here. So that's on our D10. So we've got a camera on port six. So this is the PoE camera on a PoE switch. So port six and VLAN 106. And it's while we're setting these up, it's we're talking about on the PoE ports. Remember, when you're plugging in these devices, they're actually powering up. So if there's if the device needs to boot up, it may take a second to come online, depending on the type of device and how long it takes it to boot up, because you're basically applying power as well as connectivity. So, yeah. And uh, one of the interesting things about this camera, <clears throat> excuse me, is being a PoE camera, it it uh, when it's not capturing uh, images, it's going to be in kind of a, a energy saving mode. Um, so you may see this link go up and down um, while it's not actually capturing anything. So uh, we'll get a we'll get a message down at the bottom. You see a red message coming up talking about uh, C three zero six going online and offline. Um, in well, fact, and, there and one right there. Yeah, and it, and it should too. Keep in mind, we haven't configured our trunk port yet, so none of these devices, even though they're live, none of them have been assigned an address, or or and none of them can communicate through the firewall. So until we assign right. the trunk port here at the end, we won't we won't be able to communicate to anything actually. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm going to do the last two together. So the the two VAVs um, are going to be on 105 in seven and eight. So this is our home run system where we have one device to one port. Um, so we'll put one there and we'll put two there. And I forgot which uh, VLAN that was, 105. <clears throat> As you can see, I gotta refer back to my uh, spreadsheet quite often here. Just to make and sure that I don't make any mistakes. Also worth mentioning, it's if you're using PoE, it's very unlikely you're doing daisy chains. For the vast majority of PoE equipment, it's a home run because of power requirements and and just how it's configured. So if you're planning a project and you're using PoE, you need to make sure that you're you're planning to home run those ports. You're not going to daisy chain out in the field. So just it's worth noting. All right, and, and and you can see those have now come online. It took a little a little longer because uh, of what Robert was talking power about and having power up. And I, I can actually power down that device here if I hit that change. Well, let's do it. But I, I just powered this guy down. Um, if you wait, yeah, it'll it'll go offline here. So there it goes. Went offline. I'm gonna power it back up, and it'll come back online. So I'm I'm in Vancouver and I'm able to turn the power on and off in a device that's in the, the Washington area. So that's uh, that's not bad. Yeah, spe okay, speaking so from a technical awful. a technical support perspective, it's it's very nice if you can if you're dealing with these larger systems where you're configuring a lot of switches stuff like that. It's worth your time and effort to try to get your external access set up early on. Because then you can, you, you can. There's a lot of people that are available to help you if you have configuration issues. And 
allowing us to get to that kind of equipment can save you quite a bit of time. So, yeah. So um, we've got all the devices connected, but we're not quite done yet. Um, if I go back to here, we've we've still got the aggregation switch to set up here. Uh, there's only a couple things to do. Um, on port five, we've got the the EC bus eight, and we'll add that guy. And oops, wrong one. Great here. And I believe that was one on one. Yeah, it is. It's one on one. Okay, um, and uh, you want to connect. So we, we're connecting a, a supervisory device directly to the head uh, to the um, aggregation switch, um, and that's actually a good spot to put it because uh, we 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 have a lot more bandwidth up into that device than we do um, out at the edges. And if a lot of if, if it has to talk to a lot of different things, then it will um, uh, then it will have. Well, that's interesting. So we'll we'll troubleshoot this in a second. But um, if if you have a lot of bandwidth that you need to get to it and need to get to different things on different places, then um, then you, this is a good place to put that. Um, so one of the one of the devices was, was not connecting properly. So this is the one I turned on and off. It probably timed out. Um, so I I will and it's there. Back. There we're good. Okay. So, and then the last, the last thing we need to do here, so we, we said we already preset up that management interface. Uh, we want to do all, uh, all seven of the uh, VLANs here as um, trunkable. And so we want to modify this trunk port D7. And if you remember correctly, this is the one that goes out to the router. Um, so all of these VLANs will be able to go out to the router. Uh, right now, only the management one can. Uh, but if we do 100 to 106, and we save that. So now all of these different uh, uh, VLANs are trunked. So um, just to give you an idea of what's going on in the background, uh, management interface like this takes away all the tedious work of logging into all the switches and sending the commands. Um, what it's doing in the background uh, when, for example, um, uh, let's use the example down here where I, uh, let's say I reset the, um, uh, the device here. It's, it's sending from the network controller all the way out to that edge device or that edge um, uh, uh, switch. It's sending commands um, and, and there's several, five or six or seven different commands it's got to send all at once. Um, to that device, making sure that it actually works, and and uh, and checking to see if, if um, uh, the change you made worked, uh, and then it's coming back and putting the status on here. So in, any given thing that I do here is going to mean somewhere in the background, this can uh, the network controller is actually sending um, commands out to the edge switches. And Dave, okay. can you show them the, the VLANs page real quick, just so they can see how you how you got those sure. colors? because they may want to do that. Absolutely. Um, so what you can do here, um, I'm going to add one here. We don't have uh, 101. 101. You could do 101. We don't have that one yet. Yeah. So 101 was our uh, uh, EC box. Supervisory. Supervisory. Mm -hmm. um, oh. You only have a certain number of letters to do here, but uh, I'll just call it super. And then uh, I can pick a color. Um, I'm going to pick some sort of orange color, or yeah, there we go. Dark orange. All right, so basically all I did um, was change the color for that. Uh, and if I go back to my ports page, uh, now anything that's on 101, um, will show up here with uh, with that color instead of just a number. Um, and that's uh, that's very handy when you're, uh, you want to see at a glance what they are, because the num numbers just don't stand out. Um, so it's just kind of handy. Especially when you have 500 ports to go through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if they're all supposed to be green and one orange one shows up, you know you've screwed up. Um, all right, so um, we now have 
a connected network. Um, the switches are all connected to the aggregation switch, which is connected to the internet. We've trunked all the VLANs, so uh, these are all separate. Uh, these are all separated based on the zones, the second floor, the first floor office, and the warehouse. And then we have a VLAN specifically for the security cameras for security purposes. Um, so we're, we're basically good to go. We have a running network. Um, one thing of note is there's not much traffic on this guy right now. Um, and for example, if I look at my bandwidth, oops, I got to do that too fast. There's no, there's, the system has the capability of doing um, with eight optical ports, uh, eight eight thousand megabits per second or eight, eight gigabits. Um, right now, it's running at one or two because uh, there's not a lot of messages going across. But you can see there's packets flowing uh, across the network. Um, so, and the reason why that is is because Robert's actually set up. Um, and let me switch back to his screen. Uh, Robert set up a um, program that will, uh, will uh, actually, why don't you explain it, Robert? <laughs> yeah, no problem. So here we have uh, ExpressNet Utility up, and we're showing that all of our controllers have come online. All the controllers we set up on their different, on their different VLAN, uh, they've come online. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to have Corey, who's working in the background for us, He's going to start a backnet capture for us. And so that utility is right here. We have a, an optical mm -hmm. backnet capture utility. And what that, does is, what that does is it allows us to plug it in to either one of the ports on the controller or one of the ports on the switch and assign it a VLAN. And we can capture any broadcast traffic that's going on at that point. And uh, Dave, you may want to refresh your, uh, your, there you go. Oh, sorry. And so, no problem. I have a, so I have a program here that's gonna that's gonna that's going to run normal traffic, and then when we make a change, it's gonna run um, some very bad traffic. It's gonna actually increase the broadcast by a significant margin. So I'll have Corey go ahead and start that backnet capture, and what we're gonna do here in about two minutes is we're gonna we're gonna make some changes to this program real quick, which are gonna basically turn it into a uh, a very bad controller, something we would need to find on a network and troubleshoot, and. Uh, while Corey, while Corey's doing that, we can talk a little bit about, uh, I just wanted to cover one more time. When we set up these VLANs, they're isolated from each other. And the way we do that is with a firewall. So that's, that's the job of the firewall, is to control traffic between VLANs. So we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at one of them right here, which is our uh, supervisory. So, here you can see we have rules set up that are pretty standard for VLANs, where we typically you block traffic between VLANs. That's the whole reason of having devices on one VLAN versus another is you don't you may not want them to communicate. You certainly don't want them to just to communicate across all ports. Maybe you just want them to go across 47808, or you just want them to communicate over a web port like 443. So you'll see here, this is our supervisory VLAN. And here I'm allowing that VLAN to talk to VLAN 100, 102, 103, 104, and 105. Because it's a supervisory VLAN, it needs to see all the other ones so that it can talk to all the devices. But if I go to the, the VLAN we set aside for VABs, you'll see here that these rules are enabled for it. It can't communicate to anything on these other VLANs. It's completely blocked. And so and we don't need to go into the details of how each of these rules work because every, every manufacturer, every firewall you deal with will be somewhat unique. There'll be some basics there, but the way this rule is configured on this firewall will be different. What's important to understand is that these rules have to exist. So if you're dealing with an IT department or you're setting these things up, you need to, to choose what to allow and what to, what to block so that the VLAN is doing its job. Because ultimately, security is one of the primary reasons to have a VLAN. Network, network health is another one, but the, most of the time VLANs are in place for security reasons and to have a logical grouping of devices so they're easy to manage. So I think we'll come back to the program here and we're gonna go ahead and get ready to push in our changes. So I've set up some AVs on a backnet controller and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell them to broadcast their values every three seconds. And we're gonna do about 600 of these. So not a good idea, not something you would typically wanna do on any network. 
and they're going to just broadcast nonstop. Every time, every time they're, uh, they count up by one, they're just going to broadcast a value and they're not addressing to anybody. They're just doing global broadcast. So this is a bit of a worst case scenario, something we would never do with a controller. So I'm going to send that code in. And once it's downloaded, we'll give it a couple more minutes. And then Dave's going to be able to show us what it looked like before that and after that. And then we're going to switch to a different VLAN. And we're going to show you how the VLANs protect the other controllers from this broadcast traffic. So, all right, that's going, Dave. So we got a couple minutes and we can kind of come back. And just, uh, just to bring up the network diagram, maybe we can look at it on the switch on the rack as well. You can see, you can actually see on the rack. Uh, on the uh, S8, the network, uh, um, uh, the, the, the flashing lights of the network traffic, it's going nuts right now. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, so that, that's because of the, the, the burst that, uh, that you just set up. Um, that, was, that was right here, um, this VLAN. So that, the idea of creating this VLAN is that we would isolate that traffic within that VLAN. So all of, all of that uh, broadcast traffic they just set up won't exit this VLAN. So for example, these other devices on the second floor or in the, um, uh, in the warehouse or the cameras or the management interface uh, will not see that traffic and will not be affected by it. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's the segregation aspect of it. Um, and, and we basically will we'll, we'll actually prove that to you that that's happening. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll move that back, uh, that capture tool over to another um, uh, part of the network so that you can see that it's not affected. Of, and, and here's the back net capture tool, uh, how we drew it within the network as well. I uh, we drew a dotted line here because we can move this interface around so we can capture on different devices and, and different ports uh, so that we can get uh, different VLANs um, and we'll show you how to set that up. It's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot easier um, then, to use than, it's a lot easier to use that tool than say Wireshark uh, because that tool yeah. is specific to BACnet. So you can use it with MSTP, you can use it with IP, but the nice thing about it is it's specific to BACnet traffic, so you don't have to dig through anything. It, it's going to get you the information you need, it'll upload it to the servers, and then you'll be able to visualize that and see your errors uh, very easily. So if you're, if you're troubleshooting these networks frequently, this is a really good tool to have either in your toolbox or on a large network. It's probably advisable to put one in and have it just in place so you can use it anytime you need it. Yeah, you can monitor your network that way. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and move. We have enough data from the VLAN 103. So to to while that's uploading and getting prepared to view, we're gonna move the backnet capture tool to a different VLAN so that you can see what's gonna happen on the on a neighboring network while broadcast traffic is just blazing away on 103. So I'm gonna move that to 105. You can show them that connection coming live on uh, one view if you want, Dave. So that's our cap and just came online. And so that's going to be measuring from uh, VLAN 105. So this would be, uh, I believe that's the upstairs, the second floor um, VLAN. No, sorry, it's the first floor warehouse. We, we switch from the office yeah. to the warehouse. That's what we and and this, is this is important because uh, I get calls like this a lot here at Technical Support and we help people troubleshoot all the time. And one of the issues that happens is if you make a mistake, it's not, it's not intentional, but it's very easy on these controllers. They're, they're very powerful. They can hold a tremendous amount of points. Imagine a single controller can have up to 2000 backend variables. So if you make a mistake, which it's, everybody does at some point, it won't, you won't have to have too many of these controllers doing something bad to take down a backnet network. And I, I'm sure a lot of you have been on jobs like that where you have a couple controllers doing something they shouldn't and your communication is either poor or in some cases it's down altogether. You can't get to some devices. And this is the, this is what the tool allows us to do. It allows us to, to find out not only what's going wrong, but to actually tell us which device or which devices are responsible for it. So it makes it much easier to troubleshoot and find that that single device and turn it off, or at least get in there and find out what it's doing to give you a problem. Okay, and um, so while we were talking there, uh, Corey in the background uploaded the 
um, the capture that we got from that capture tool to our um, uh, visual backnet product. Uh, and what, what this does is it analyzes the traffic and, and runs a few diagnostics on it and, um, uh, and, and basically tells you roughly what's wrong with the network. Um, so what time is it now? It's uh, 9.45, that looks about right. So we're going to have a look at this. Um, so first of all, um, you know, we, we can see a lot of packets are being sent um, within that network. Uh, and this is on the 103 um, where we introduced that uh, broadcast storm. And as you can see, Actually, we, we, use the S1, we use the S1000 to introduce that. Yes, right. Uh, and then that's on the 103 VLAN. Yes, sir. And so when we introduced all that extra traffic, uh, you can see the massive increase. Um, and, and it's all broadcast uh, traffic as well. Just a couple things of note. So um, this, this is actually done 26 uh, diagnostics checks. Um, one failed, and that is that we have too much uh, broadcast traffic. Um, okay. and we, can, we can take a look. If you're a Wireshark expert, you could go in and look at this and, and read the matrix. Uh, but if you're not, you, you, a tool like this really helps. Uh, certainly I'm not. Um, so we can see that it was uh, the dot 52 that was sending it and what port it was sending on. So that's the botnet port. Uh, 52 is the S1000. Uh, we can see it sent 9,000 broadcast packets during that um, particular burst. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of these different packets and you can actually go in and look at them if, if you're interested in doing that. Uh, I won't in this discussion. It's a little too low level for us. Well, I will. Um, can, can, we, can you show them just real quick, Dave? Before you, I know it's a little bit on, just under the one tab where it shows internet, uh, where it shows uh, source and destination, just so they understand why that's a broadcast packet. It's it's sure. just to show them that you, you can see there it's broadcast because you'll see under where it says SRC, it says source, and that's the controller that's sending it. And you'll see under destination. It just says 255. It's not directed towards anybody. And that's what makes it a, a broadcast packet. It's not, it's just being sent out there globally. Yeah. So it's coming from it, the, the 255 is, if you remember back to uh, IP address discussion, uh, on that subnet, that's a broadcast. Um, and that's on the, the, the great thing about this is I'm, I can't even see the VLANs on this page, but if you remember the way we designed this, um, the 103. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, subnet matches the 103 VLAN, and that's great because that helps me a lot when I'm troubleshooting. Okay, um, so that was uh, and I'll just put this there. That was um, that was that one. And uh, are are we good with the uh, capture on the second? Yeah, we should be good to go. And it's it's Not worth noting that we had we had nine thousand we had nine thousand packets go out. That was that was one controller, and we didn't even push that controller that hard. You see, if we multiply yeah. that times 100 or 200 or even a thousand controllers, you can see where if you make a mistake on a say a VAV and you push the program into all the VAVs, it's going to be it's going to be a you have a lot of network problems and congestion, and you're probably not going to be able to communicate to all of your devices because the each one of these devices the switch isn't going to go down. But each one of these devices, when you're doing a bunch of broadcast traffic, each one of them has to deal with all of that traffic. And it's, they're powerful devices, but they're nowhere near as powerful as a switch when it comes to handling packets and traffic. So what's going to happen is if you broadcast too much stuff, they're simply going to, when their queue fills up, they're simply going to drop whatever doesn't fit. So, and you're not going to be able to control what they pick, you know, what they choose to drop and what they choose to keep. So it's going to be intermittent and you're gonna, it's going to be very problematic for you. Yeah. And that, that's the, the beautiful thing about the way we've designed this is it's contained here. Um, so all of these other devices are not impacted by it at all. Uh, one of the worst things you can do, for example, is you can leave your management interface um, on the same, for example, if you don't have VLANs, your management interface is on the same as your traffic. Uh, and if you, if you get a broadcast storm like that, um, it'll take your management down with it and you will you won't be able to recover. So um, we while we we're doing that and I'll get rid of these really quickly. Oops. And bring back up. Okay. 
So um, I have a thumbs up that we have. Got some uh, reverb there. So we've got also a so have another capture here, um, and this one's on VLAN 105. Um, so this is happening in, in that broadcast going on in, on the 103. We've got um, just normal traffic. Uh, you know, we have it's still broadcast, but it's it's just at a normal rate. Um, and that will be similar to if we go back up to here. So this is about 50 uh, packets per second. Um, it's running every few seconds. Um, and so our, our new one on the 105 is doing exactly the same thing. So that's it. that's operating normally. <clears throat> now you can see we have a warning here. Um, one of the things we did was we actually, um, this is actually all broadcast traffic. Uh, but they're warning us that it's all broadcast traffic, and, and that's okay. It's not really that uh, big of a broadcast, whereas on the other one we had a storm that could, you know, that given a bigger set of uh, a bigger group of devices on that VLAN, it could cause a lot of trouble. Okay, um, so that's that's kind of troubleshooting. Um, the other thing we wanted to do uh, is talk about security as well. Um, we, uh, we haven't referred back to the slides, but um, all, all of the stuff that we've been talking about is in there, um, and you can reference it later if you'd like. Um, so let's talk about security uh, of the system. So we did talk about the cameras themselves being secure, and we've got them on a separate VLAN for that specific purpose. Uh, so that's great. That's already done. Um, the other thing we wanted to do from a security perspective is protect uh, the ports on our switches from somebody just walking into the room and plugging a device into one of those open ports uh, or switching devices around to different ports. Um, so what we want to do is we want to lock the system down. Um, so there's two things that happen there. One is um, in, these, in the case of these managed switches, the optical ones, um, they have the ability to, um, say, for a, a port that does not have anything attached to it, lock it down and don't let anybody uh, access it. So um, uh, it, it will not accept any link from any device that, that goes into that port. Um, so I can turn that on. Uh, and then the second thing that's a really good practice to do is um, Say, for example, um, on this on this uh, C1, which is our first floor office, we don't want anybody except for this S1000 device connected to port one, um, and we're going to do that by MAC address. Um, so that MAC address is uh, is fixed to that device, and only that device with that MAC ad address can connect into it. Um, so again, uh, this is all done under the hood by um, sending um, commands from the network controller and the OneView uh, system out to the different edge devices to tell them to lock it down. Um, let me just zip over to the security page. Um, it, it's not terribly exciting here, but you click a button. <laughs> um, I actually have, because we have uh, daisy chain, I'll, I'll, I'll click this guy here as well. So it'll secure, uh, it'll allow multiple devices to be on that single port, so that takes care of daisy chains. But if I lock this, I'll confirm it, and you can see it's running. So in the background, it's sending out all those commands to the switches. Um, I will zip back to my ports page. Um, we're going to see a lot of uh, confirmations going on here. Um, but you can see here we've got a lock uh, here for this particular uh, port. So it's locked by MAC address, um, and that's it. That's the only thing that's allowed to connect to it. Um, so that's the, those, those are definitely best practices, and you only find those with managed switches. You won't find that with a, you know, off the shelf uh, something you can buy at your local computer store. Dave, can you uh, show me? Uh, can you show me the um, daisy chain port so they can see that there's more than one uh, MAC address locked on yeah. the daisy chain port? Absolutely. I have to remember which one it is, and because I put a description in here, I do. You can see it has two rules. Two, yep. Um, and we can actually, device security, 
we can see which two it is allowed. And it's these two MAC addresses here. And and it, a lot of times, I know most of you probably dealt with this on a customer site before where they've used some type of port security to lock down ports. So you can't, you can't use your, you can't just replace a device with your laptop or put in your own router or something like that. But this, this is not cumbersome. This is actually something you should consider using and, and it's a, a great tool for you because it's extremely easy to turn off. So if you're a tech and you're coming to site, all you have to do is when you get there, you log into the switch and Dave will show you how to do it. You can simply just disable that security right there right. for that network. So you can put your laptop in and whatever you need to do. And then when you're done, you can re-enable it. It's very easy. You can do it for all of the switches or just the port you need. Yeah. But this, this makes it very quick and easy for you to keep the site secure. But uh, when you get there, you can unlock it for it to do whatever you need to do. Yeah, very, very simple to do. And you can, I, I did, when I did that single click, it was for the whole network, but you can do it for individual uh, switches or individual ports as well, just as easily. Okay, um, I think that is everything we want to cover with designing this particular network. It's now up and running. We have a contained tornado storm on one of the VLANs that we left running for now. Uh, Still going. We can troubleshoot that and, uh, and disable it, but uh, no, no worries whatsoever. Um, the other interesting thing that you can do here, by the way, just uh, somebody reminded me of the security report. Um, if, you wanna, if you wanna get a list of the entire network and what's turned on and off, um, you can get that right here as well within that. You, you don't see it initially when you look at the screen, but uh, if you scroll down, uh, so you can see what's locked on what port and so forth. All right. Um, I think that's it. So. Um, Amazing. Time for questions? I Jump back in here. Yeah, so that we have about half an hour for questions. If people have questions now is your moment to uh, let us know what they are. We can already see some coming in and we have a few that have already come in. So um, these two, there's two that actually back really well together. Is, let's start with, is there a lim limited number of VLANs that can be used or configured? Is, it, is there a limit to the number? Yes. Yeah, it's a little over, it's it's over 4,000. It's about 4,093, I think. So it's, there's a lot. And then keep in mind that that's, th those can, those don't have to be specific to an entire site. They can be reused. For instance, like you could have a, a you might have a job where you use the network 192.168.0. Whatever. Well, if you go to a totally different job, you can reuse that. And so sometimes VLANs, you'll see them not only reused on different sites, but you may see them reused on the same site if it's part of a different architecture. But if you're talking about right now on this switch or on this network, we're limited to uh, 4,093. So some, not something you're likely to have a problem with. Hopefully not. <laughs> if, if your site's that big, you will probably run into other problems first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So directly related to that, can you give some VLAN structure guidance for small, medium, and large buildings? Sure. I'll let you go first, Dave, and then I'll follow. How's that? Sure. Um, you know, we, we, what we showed here uh, was, uh, for, you know, for security purposes, uh, we, we set up the cameras on every floor. Let's say you have, um, you know, they have a 54 building. Uh, you can still create a VLAN specifically specifically for the uh, video cameras, so you can secure them uh, separately. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, I, I would say you either do it by ge geographic area or, or zone or whatever, um, or you can do it by service. Uh, so, for example, you might want to separate your uh, your door locks from your uh, from your uh, lighting or your air conditioning. Um, yeah, so you might want to do it by that, and you could also combine that and maybe just say uh, for the three, these three floors that are related to this company, for example, um, I want to create a VLAN for their air conditioning because it's different than somebody else's. Maybe there's a lab 
uh, within a, a specific area and you want to section that off so the air conditioning is different uh, and not affected by anybody else. That's especially true, say, in a university um, where you would have a lot of research going on that depends on specific temperatures not varying by much um, and, and items like that. Um, so that, that would be, a, from, from my point of view, that would be how I would uh, separate them. Just kind of a logical, you like that. I, I, my experience has been I've seen I've seen a lot of universities and they they make heavy use of them of course but even then on a lot of uh, a lot of shell and core work where you might go in and you might have a lot of tenants doing build outs later on on a given floor and we see that is a really great use of the product there where you come in and you know that the customers you're building the building or you're doing the shell and core and you know they're going to have a lot of different tenants and VLANs make a lot of sense for that because that way you can segregate it off that way if the customer wants to see their equipment you can use a VLAN to make sure that they can only see their equipment if they plug a laptop in and they may have different security requirements and VLANs allow for you to take care of that. And you definitely don't want your broadcast traffic from one customer to, to go over another VLAN to another. So uh, for tenant improvement, they're really valuable. Also, um, they can be a good, and this is not always recommended, but they can be a good organizational tool. If you're doing a large site and you have a lot of equipment um, certain types of equipment tend to communicate together. For example, an air handler, you're probably going to have a lot of communication to the VAVs under that air handler. So it makes sense to put them on a VLAN, allow them to broadcast to each other, and then for the next air handler to allow it to have a VLAN with its VAVs, and that way you can bring all that up into the supervisory controller. But it makes sense because you're, you're isolating traffic where you know they're going to need to talk, and then you want to leverage broadcast traffic, and that's a good way to do it and keep it segregated from the rest of the network. So. Uh, those are the two scenarios that I use the most often. Yeah, and then just one one more uh, to add to that is if you're doing renovation, for example, and yeah. um, you're, let's say you're rebuilding one piece of your campus or one piece of your building, um, and you want to isolate that from everything else, um, you can build like a temporary VLAN for the entire isolated area, and then as you build things out, you can pull them off and, and add them back to your regular VLANs. That's a common, I would say VLANs are a common solution to uh, when people are using visual backlight and see that broadcast, the way too much broadcast traffic is often, oh, let's take all the lighting off of our network. Oh, let's take this thing um, to, to reduce that broadcast traffic. Yeah. Um, so continuing down this VLAN path, uh, so Matt, Matt just wants to confirm that the VLAN gets com configured in two places. So in the router, um, you have to define the address, and then in Optigo, we just associate the port with the VLAN. Can you confirm that and maybe elaborate if necessary? It, in this setup, that's exactly how it worked, yeah. But you may, I mean, on a larger system, uh, you, 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 the firewall may be completely different. You may have the managed switches, the managed switches themselves may configure the VLANs. In fact, if we didn't have a firewall here and this was a standalone site, we could have configured the VLANs just on the Optigo interface and not had right. any other routing up through that. So if, if we just had a standalone site and it wasn't gonna go to the internet or we weren't coming in, we could have simply done a couple of VLANs right here and said maybe we did the the controllers and then we did the cameras because there's no reason the ECYs would talk to the cameras. So if we were doing a standalone yeah. site, we would just separate those with a VLAN and, and be done with it, right? So the VLANs can be configured in multiple locations. I will say that yeah. the setup we just did is probably the most typical. Yeah. Where, where we pass the VLANs down to the managed switches and we control the VLANs at the firewall. That's for, for general, like a smaller site or a mid-site site, that's very typical to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and just to expand on that, if, if you had all of the devices within a VLAN on a single switch, um, you wouldn't have to trunk it out to anywhere else unless you wanted to access it somewhere else, in which case you would definitely only, you'd be only setting up the access for starter and you'd, and you'd only set it up on that single switch. So that's the simplest version of it. Um, not as not necessarily the most useful, uh, but it would allow you to, let's say you had a 24 or 48 port switch and you wanted to segregate that up into pieces, you could do that with uh, only, uh, admin, uh, only, main, uh, only setting it up on the switch itself. And managing there. It's also another scenario. If you're setting up a site and you don't have a firewall yet, it's completely fine to configure your VLANs initially in one view get everything set up, get your, your working on site. And then later when the IT department comes in or they have that infrastructure in place, then you can trunk it in. 
But in the meantime, you still want to, like I said, if you have dissimilar devices, you can kind of already set that up ahead of time when you're working on a new site and you don't have internet yet. Get You can still set it up and do it, and then later you just trunk it in. And, and your setup will still work just fine. Okay, so um, we didn't talk too much specifically about BDMDs and that stuff, but uh, we do have a question here. Should you avoid using BDMDs to propagate broadcast between VLANs? Does it defeat a lot of the segregation benefits? This is, this is a big topic and it, it, it goes around and around. We hear about it a lot. So in a, in a, in a perfect scenario, what you would do is you might use a BBMD initially because that, that will help you discover devices. Because right now, if we have all these controllers separated and segregated on different VLANs, we can't discover them. That won't work because a discover, we, no matter what system you're using, whether it's a, you know an EC boss or another Eclipse controller or a third party device, discover is a broadcast traffic. So that won't work across VLANs. So there's a couple ways to handle that. A BBMD is one, and you can set that up and to discover everything and bring everything in, but ultimately it's advisable to turn it off. Once you have those devices and you've discovered them and you have communication going back and forth, then you really want to turn it off. And if you have broadcast traffic that needs to go from an air handler controller to a VAD, then ultimately you really want to try to keep those on the same VLAN to segregate that traffic. You're right. It, it, when you set up BBMD, you, in a sense, you defeat the the purpose of the VLAN because this right now we're running a broadcast storm on one VLAN, and you can see the other VLAN is protected from that. The controllers don't see it; they're communicating just fine. They're not affected. If we had a BBMD running, they would definitely see it. We would we would see all that traffic on the other VLAN. So, yeah. Why, if I was setting up a job, I definitely might use BBMDs initially to get everything set up, bring everything in. But once I started having all my communication in place. I'm definitely going to probably turn them off. And there are some other strategies to allow you to communicate between VLANs that we can talk about outside of this. So BBMD is not the only one. Another good one to remember is, and Dave, if you bring up on one view, if you want to bring up the trunk port real quick, there, yeah, you, you, can, you have if you have a supervisor or some type of supervisory setup, there are ways in Windows and in Linux and in Mac, there are ways to bring these VLANs directly into the computer. So, and we, this is probably not a good discussion for here, but you can always call technical support and we can talk to you about that. Because it, let's say I had a supervisor for a big site, I can actually bring in those VLANs directly to the computer. And then the, the supervisory controller, the, in this case, we'll talk about uh, EC, ECnet for Distech, but that, that software can then, once you bring all those VLANs in, that software can then discover across all those VLANs. And it can see traffic from all those VLANs. So as long as you separate out those those network cards or you do it through uh, virtual network cards with a VM. So we have a lot of great strategies for that. So it, like I said, BBMDs can, that discussion can blow up. But yes, yeah. ultimately in the end, we, they really should be avoided if at all possible. And the larger the site, the more that holds true. On a small site, it's probably not gonna be as big of a deal, but the bigger your site gets, the higher the number of controllers, you really want to avoid BBMD in the long run. It's it's going to cause you problems because it doesn't take, if I can have one controller do 9,000 packets per second and it's not even fully loaded, imagine a site with thousands of controllers. You don't want to be in a scenario where you make a mistake and now you can't, now you have to physically go to these controllers and plug into them to undo the damage you've done, right? So. Um, yeah, it's a. You can tell I get a little bit passionate about it, but ultimately, BBMDs are a good thing. They're not a bad thing. It's just they need to be used appropriately, and that's the key. Perfect. Um, one thing I want to mention because we had some questions come in during the webinar, you will notice at the top of the screen uh, we are using a version of OneView that's currently in beta. So a couple of you who are, or any of you that are customers, you, yours may look a little bit different. Um, if you have questions about that, you want to get in on the beta, anything, just contact us. Um, these aren't features that are exclusive to the beta by any means, um, but it might look a little bit different. Uh, okay, another question, uh, continuing off of that, uh, how will BACnet SC impact all of this? And we have a BACnet SC webinar that we did a couple weeks ago, so. 
Um, we don't want to go too deep into this for too long, but do we have any insight into that? So uh, that's an interesting one. Um, I, I, I can jump on that right away, but uh, uh, BACnet SD is going to be a change in the way things happen. So r right now, um, all these uh, BACnet packets are being sent basically clear across the network. Um, they're, they're not encrypted, and therefore anybody who, uh, as you can see by the BACnet capture tool, anybody that um, connects uh, something to it will see those packets. Um, when we go to BACnet SC, uh, we're going to be creating a secure tunnel very similar to what we did with the VPN. Um, and so that changes us from a UDP to a TCB connection. And if you remember back to, um, I think it was webinar three, we talked about the difference between those two things. Um, TCP is a uh, basically a point-to-point -point, uh, 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 connection and connection-oriented um, uh, messaging. So whereas UDP, you can broadcast and you can send out to the network uh, as opposed to, to a specific destination. Um, so if we're moving to a, a, a TCP-based system, um, all of that broadcast is going to go away. Uh, it'll have to be replaced by um, a BACnet secure hub. And that BACnet secure hub all the devices will be connected to it, all of them will have a connection open to it, and all of them uh, will uh, uh, register for uh, broadcast messages, and the hub will know which devices to send uh, which, uh, which message to. And you kind of, uh, the concept of the DDMD disappears at that point. It, it, it's irrelevant uh, because the, the hub takes care of managing where to send which backnet message uh, to which device. And so you can do all of your management on the hub at that point. Um, so that's going to be a very big change to the way things are done here. Um, but it's also going to add, a, a, you know, obviously the, the security level. It's going to add management on that uh, hub that's going to be significant. So you're going to need a managed system similar to this to do that. Um, and, and managing sessions between uh, devices in the hub and so forth. It's going to be interesting. Um, it's going to take us a while to get all that worked out and, and uh, in place, but uh, once it is, it's going to be a really nice, secure network um, with really well-defined uh, communication between the different uh, uh, devices within a network rather than being broadcast, uh, uh, just kind of let it, let it fall where it may. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and again, lots more on to think about with BACnet I, I, uh, SC, but this, a lot of what we're talking about here is also not just relevant to BACnet, it's any traffic that's running through your network. Um, so switching over a little bit, do you need a static IP from your ISP to set up the open VPN? A lot of acronyms here. No, not, not at all. In fact, I don't have one at all. I don't have a static IP and we do. So uh, I use dynamic DNS. So what I do is I have, uh, I have a piece of software and it, it can run on your computer. It may be on your switch or your firewall. It's almost everywhere. Here. And so what it does is every time my IP address changes, it goes and updates the registrar for a domain name I have, and it changes that IP there. So when Dave goes to connect to me, he doesn't use an IP to connect to me. He resolves a domain name, and that IP address will change. Yeah, and it should be in the preferences for the, not there, but the, uh, Dave, you can show him the preferences for that connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And under that, yeah, under that, you'll see it. That domain name updates with a new IP every time my IP changes. So all Dave has to do is um, resolve that domain name. And then you, and I do the same thing when I do sites, I typically do the same thing for job sites as well. Uh, use dynamic DNS to give a domain name. And that way you're not trying to remember an IP address. It's, uh, and almost most routers these days handle it. Even, even the router likely in your home will do dynamic DNS now. Most of them do, a lot of equipment does. Even uh, the EC boss, that, that can do dynamic DNS. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. It's very easy to do. You can always call. Technical support will help you out with that if you have any questions. But that's how I run this here. Um, obviously, I don't have a, I have, it's at home, but I don't have a home connection. I obviously have a business line, which has a much higher bandwidth. But 
I don't, I didn't have a need for a static IP. There's really no need for one. Great. Um, once the system is configured, is it possible to generate some kind of report and, and document how it is in that exact moment, especially if you're doing handoff to a customer or to a contractor? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we can show you two, I think we can show the example on the disk tech side and the example on, on the optical side. But if I go back, um, best way to do this, uh, there is a security report. Um, which is interesting. It does show you MAC address, but we don't have IP. Um, we also have, um, not sure where it is in the system, but should be. So uh, the answer is yes. And um, again, if, if, if you want to know exactly how to do it on this interface, um, this is one way. Uh, There's another way to print it off, and I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, you can, but, if you want, uh, we, we, you can. We can help you. We, we'll, we can send you out a, uh, a, a description on how to do that. It's fairly straightforward. I'm sure one of our trusty background people will chime in here shortly. Yeah, yeah. and, and this, this is a, it's a little small, but I, you don't need to seem specific. We have a utility called Express Network Utility, and that what that'll do is you can you can put your computer, you can run this wherever you want. You can plug your laptop in. You can you can put it on the supervisory computer wherever you like. But as long as you're on the same VLAN as those controllers, you can do a discover and it will bring those controllers in. And you can do this multiple times if you want a separate file for each VLAN or if you want, you can combine them all. And so I can export this right there. I just export this. And when I, so in fact, I'll show you when I close this, if I open it again and I bring in, uh, it'll be empty. And there's no need for me to rediscover. All I have to do is import that previous, the one I previously exported. And now I have all my devices and I simply right click and refresh all items. So this is the report I generate. If I'm on a site, a large site, I do what Dave did. I go to my managed interface on my, on one view, I export that information, but here I maintain this and then I generate a report from this and I have this. And when you export this, it's a simple CSV file. So you're able to open it in Excel and view all the, you can see all your your firmware versions, your controller names, your host IDs, your MAC address, and your IP address. So you can very easily track everything down. Okay. And um, actually, I was reminded that the reports are over here. Oh, there we go. Thanks to Jan. Uh, well, this will give me a status report of uh, everything on the switches. So the configuration, the version numbers, uh, and then here we go with all the different um, switch information on all the ports um, and so forth. So still building it. But um, but again, just the, the, all the information that you saw on the main screen is, is within this report and you can print that off or, or save it. Uh, you can also export the ports page uh, yeah. from the ports page. Yes. Yeah. So lots of different options there. Um, so the last question that I have for you guys, if anyone else has questions, please ask them now. We still have a little bit of time. Um, but is there any recommended uh, maintenance things? So we've talked a lot about setup and how to, how to configure your system and get it working. Is there anything that you recommend doing um, on an annual basis or some kind of timeline to maintain the system? Are we talking physically for the for the equipment, or are we talking from a software standpoint, from a a, a managing that way? Or? I'm going to say any of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're if you're running these switches, it's always good every now and then, just because of the the switch the the racks tend to move a little bit when people are bustling around and doing things. They can get dusty. It's always good if every now and then to go and make sure that your that especially on the back, make sure your, your universal power cord, make sure that's well seated. Those can come loose over time when things heat up, people move things, other people work in your rack. So you wanna make sure that's well seated. And if it's not tight, you wanna replace that cable. If it's a looser cable, because when you get them initially, they plug in, they're very tight. The same goes for your RJ45 connections. Those connectors should be fairly strong. When you press down on one, it shouldn't be weak. It shouldn't easily come loose. So 
you want to make sure those connections are seated tightly, and then your and then your your when you test them that they're not loose. That you can't. I should not be able when I pull this. If it's the proper connector, I should not be able to have the lights come off just by putting some pressure on it. It should. I should have to depress that click to get it out. And also on the back, yeah. there's two power supplies back here. There's redundant power supplies on the on some of the switches. In fact, all of the edge switches, I believe, have redundant power supplies, correct? Or redundant feeds, Dave? So you want to you want to mm -hmm. make sure both of both of those you're utilizing both of those. And so. If you'll notice on the bottom, you can't really see it, but on the bottom of this rack, I have two UPSs, not one, but two. And I plug in on the back, I plug in the switches to both. That way, in the event a cable came loose or someone was doing work on one of them, or even one of the UPSs failed, that my network is still up and running. And these, they're very inexpensive yeah. items that we're talking about here. The UPSs we're talking about are not expensive. Adding another power cable is cheap. So these are really easy, inexpensive things to do that can uh, prevent some problems for you in the past. Uh, as far as yeah. software is concerned, yeah, you, you should occasionally, you should generate a report every time you're on site for this, for, through one view. You need to have, you, need to, you should generate one every time. So you, have, so you have something to compare to the past because likely you're not going to look at all the information there. And if something goes wrong, you want those reports to go through. And you also want to back up your config every time you, after your initial setup, every time you visit the site for service, you want to back up your config in one view. You want to back up whatever's there to make sure any changes that have been made since you initially set it up that you get those. Because somebody might go in and switch a VLAN around or do something. And if you don't remember, and you have a switch fail and you reload it, you're going to lose that. And the same is the same is true for any of your backend IP devices. When you're on site, you want to make sure you do a scan and that you have a copy of the latest scan. And you make sure you have all your devices listed there, and that way. Um, I think that about covers it for your basic maintenance you would do. Yeah, so certainly you, you want to you wanna know what your software versions are, uh, especially if you have management software like this, um, and there'll be new versions coming out, um, you know, maybe a, a couple times a year, um, and you want to be updating to the latest version as often as you can. Same with firmware for the uh, switches and the devices. Um, so you want to kind of monitor that. Um, if you have an asset management system, you can do that through there, um, and those will usually remind you um, when it's time to upgrade. Uh, when it's try for example, when a, a power supply has a warranty period, and when that runs out, you, you're going to want to replace that. So you should have a, a, a cycle of replacement for, for parts like that. Um, on the fiber side, we, we mentioned earlier about keeping that clean. You should do that fairly often. Um, don't, don't remove it to clean it. If it's working, leave it, leave it in. Yeah, it, but but you, can, you can check that. And, and if you have problems with it, uh, another uh, maintenance uh, item to, to purchase would be a, um, a power measurement tool. So uh, you can basically hook that up to the end of a, a cable and it will, it will measure how much attenuation is uh, through the entire wire itself. And that, that can change over time. So um, if, you, if you run into problems where you're uh, laser power drops too low or goes too high, um, uh, you can measure that using that tool. Uh, so that would be handy to buy along with the cleaner. One thing that I want um, to revisit that you had mentioned, something that we come across far too often is, hey, our network's been working for 10 years, so we've never updated anything because it works. Yeah. We've never updated our software, our firmware. Um, thoughts? I, 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 I'm going to, I'll jump in real quick. Here, for when it comes to disk tech, we, we really recommend you you do update your systems. Of course, those things should be planned. Your customer should be informed. You should test those things out. If you're going to run a new firmware and a controller, ideally you would test that in your office to make sure, you know, before you before you push it into a thousand controllers, you know, do a little testing. But we really kind of have a top-down approach. So um, for us, if you have a supervisory controller and then you have other controllers underneath it, typically we'd like you to to kind of Make sure you're up to date at the top, and then kind of work your way down to the smallest devices. You know your end of line devices, um, but obviously do some testing and keep your customer informed along the way. But we, you know, along with features, these new firmwares we put out. I mean, they they have a lot of bug fixes, uh, along with those features. So we really do with proper testing. We really encourage you to always keep your controllers and your devices up to date. And I'll let Dave talk about Optigo's strategy on that. 
Yeah, it, it's it's exactly the same. Um, we 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 obviously would, um, from a support perspective, we would love to have everybody on the latest. Um, and, and we we do understand the sentiment there. Um, it, it's extra work to to maintain and and upgrade a system as you're going. Uh, but at the same point, if you have uh, it was a ten year old uh, system that's been working, well, it, that's great until it's not working. Um, and then the people who troubleshoot it have retired, and and nobody understands that system very well uh, because it's ten years old. Um, so you, you you definitely want to keep up to date with anything related to uh, internet, with anything related to software. Um, it's, it's it's very important uh, from a from a troubleshooting uh, point of view. It, and and you know what, you're it's a gamble. If you want to leave that 10-year-old system the way it is, uh, it's just a gamble, and, and, and you're gambling that uh, it's not going to break. Um, on the other hand, when it does, uh, you're going to pay a higher price. And the great thing about upgrading on your schedule is that if something goes wrong, it's on your schedule rather than yeah. waiting for it to break at 2 a.m. on Christmas Day, and suddenly, you know, all hell breaks loose. So. And, and, and keep in mind, you if you even have, if you've been doing systems in the past, and many of you've been doing controls for a long time. The, the problem is, you know, there wasn't as big of a concern when it was Lawn or MSTP or Modbus, because uh, typically someone had to physically be on the network and then they had to understand it. So there wasn't, you weren't as worried about someone say hacking your lawn network. But uh, these days with the networks we're dealing with and the exposure and everybody's doing everything remotely, a lot of these updates we release have security fixes. And so, I mean, and it's, it's you know, I know you're not really, you're not going through all the release notes and reading all the small stuff and it's not highlighted, but, but uh, the vast majority of the time you really want to stay up to date from a security standpoint, if for nothing else, you really want to keep your equipment up to date because whether it's a VAV controller or a aggregation switch, all these things, all of these things are IP now. And so all of them have potential security risks. So you, you need to keep them up to date to stay ahead of that. And uh, that's, if for no other reason, not just it was working before and I want to leave it that way because there you may have some issues and you may be exposing your customer to security risks that they're unaware of. And that's never a fun conversation to have if they if something happens and they call you into a room, you don't you don't want to be in that chair. So um, it's ultimately you need to keep your equipment up to date. Yeah, the building automation world is starting to move quickly on security. So take advantage and update your stuff. It's a good sales opportunity too, because for a service contract, I mean, that's something you would describe to a customer. It's like, do they really want to maintain that? Or do, for security reasons, they'd really like to have, you know, you, the person who installed it, have you involved and have you back on site to back it up and to maintain it and do those security updates. So it's, it's also a good opportunity to talk to your customer about security and maybe get a service contract to handle that. Yeah. Hopefully we've given you some things that you can take to the customer now and, and make that argument. All right, uh, we have a couple more questions, but I'm, we'll, we'll sure, deal with them over email. We'll get back to everyone. Um, but we're going to call it because that's been two hours and probably everyone needs to go eat and get back to their real lives. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. There will be a survey that pops up as soon as this uh, webinar window is closed. Please fill it in. We want to know what else we can do for you, how we can help you more, um, what other topics we can cover. And if you are interested in troubleshooting, particularly troubleshooting BACnet, we're doing another webinar uh, in about a month and we'll be live troubleshooting BACnet. So uh, thanks again for joining us. If you have any questions, you can email us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Robert and Dave. Thanks a lot. Bye.